be seated. And I'm going to invite, I guess, is Cliff still going first? Cliff is on first. Thanks, Cliff, for coming and obeying the Lord and blessing us. Oh, there's kids for children's church, and we have a blessing of having Rhonda and Gordy do that. So if you're in children's church, be released and go with Gordy and Rhonda. Talia, are you going? She needs a, a jacket on, or she's probably hot-blooded. Okay. <laughs> Bless you all. <laughs> you pray for me? I do. Father, thank you for this, your vessel, this willing vessel that, Lord, I've, I've looked at Cliff for many years and knew that he was called to missions and just waited for you to, to open that door for him. And so, Father, thank you that you have. Thank you that it's been Mexico. Uh, he's been to Dominican. And, Lord, we just know from Acts 1-8 that you can take us to, what is it, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And some of those places you've visited have been uttermost. Mm -hmm. So share with us what you've got you. and be blessed. Up in the mountain. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Teresa. And thank you for the, the blessing of being able to share today. And it's a blessing to be able to preach the word of God and privilege. Um, before I went, uh, I got encouraged by a sister. And she is Philippians 4.13. And it says, uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if, if you, and that really encouraged me because many, I thought about that when I was down there because I thought, God, I can't do this. If I looked at it in the natural, it's beyond my strength. But, and the sister encouraged me in that because she was at a time, God encouraged her with that same scripture and something, she was leading a Bible study and she said, God, I can't do this. And then the scripture came to her and then I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And and it's about missions, right? And I went to Mexico, and it, there's challenges, many challenges, the heat. I went in July. I don't know why I went in July, but I did. But it's God's presence, God's strength. It's beyond my strength, and sometimes we, he's got to break us down so that he can use us, right? And, and, and I thought about Jesus, and he asked the uh, boy with the three loaves and five fishes, something like that, and... He said, what do you have in your hand? And, and that's what he had was something very little, but Jesus used what he had in his hand. So it's not a big thing, missions. You, you, we can be missionaries in our town, in Judea, on the island, in Canada, and to the uttermost parts of the world. That's what uh, we're called to, right? And whatever that looks like, God prepares us for that. And just like the boy with the fishes and the loaves, God increases. He brought the increase of, of himself, of the kingdom of God, through the breaking of the bread and the fishes, right? So God can use all of us, right? And um, I, when I went in July, I went with a group of youth uh, from 13 to 15, 13 to 21 years old. And I, we went for a week. We stayed in this house. Everybody got along good. It was like 35 degrees out. It was hot for me, right? And I would, but I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to serve you here. And I, and I didn't preach as much as I thought I might. And the preaching was a uh, stretch for me. And I just prayed, trusted God in that because I said, I can't do this. But I can do all things. That's what the Bible says. But all the, these young people, they were tremendous. They were beautiful that God used them and they stepped up. They're from Mexico, from uh, Chiapas, and from five different churches. They were anywhere from 13, I already said that, to 21. But 13-year-old boy, David, he led worship. And uh, I was there the first time, and he, he was trembling, and his knees were shaking. And then the next time and the next time, I noticed God was working. It was a, it was, God's blessing was on it, but he wasn't afraid. And then there was different ones that uh, they just, they would testify or, because they ran the service, they didn't, it wasn't like somebody, you know, it was all organized, but they ran the service, they preached. Some of them, I know, 17 years old, uh, there's a young man, he was 21, and he, 
he just came to give somebody a drive. He wasn't, I don't know if he was really following the Lord that closely, and God did a work in his heart, and he ended up preaching, I don't know, three times or two times, and then he, he led worship, and God worked on his heart, so I was blessed to be a part of that, right? And I liked it because it was a different form of mission in my, my heart and my mind, what I thought missions were, you know, like preaching the gospel, and that's, that's powerful, but it's also about changing, preaching the gospel to change lives, and we want to see lives changed, as I've seen in the young people changed, right? So that's part of church, right? In Campbell River, I mean, we've seen changes in our lives in church here, so you go down there, and it's nice to see lives changed in these young people, even in a short time, right? Like here they are ministering, right? I think that's David right there. He's 13 years old. And uh, that was uh, kind of a high water mark for me because I thought, you know, uh, why am I afraid? Why am I afraid? This little guy, maybe 100 pounds. Why am I afraid? So it, God used that, right? So God works in our lives in amazing ways, right? And uh, that's one of the ways because uh, even last night I was thinking, okay, I'm, I'm nervous here, but I'm going to think about David and and how he, God used him, and he wasn't afraid, and then they would just uh, say, oh, you're going to preach today, the young person, right? And they would get ready, and they would help them if they weren't experienced at preaching or singing or testifying. They would encourage them in it, right? So they would have a day, and sometimes I'd like a week, or I would like two weeks, right? But, you know, it's interesting that you see God, we take the limits off, and God can work, right? There's, I'm still, you, don't, you still prepare, but it's amazing what God can do, right? And because it's his spirit that's active as we're willing and obedient, right? And uh, like even first service, I, God laid something on my heart. The first scripture was different. So now this is a different scripture again. So God works in our lives like that, right? And we want to see him work. But, and the word is powerful and it comes because the word preached um, is active and powerful as we proclaim it, right? And we're called to proclaim the good news, right? And God knows who's the, who the receivers are. God, God knows the timing of that word as it's preached, and that's a powerful thing. And missions is about timing, calling, right? He directs us. Uh, we went to the, the mountains in uh, Oaxaca, and I didn't preach that much, but I preached once, I think. But it was beautiful because we've seen... The persecution that took place 10 years previous, out of the persecution sprang, uh, uh, like, we, we drove two hours out of town, up into the mountains with lots of switchbacks, and, uh, like, going to Sayward or, like, going to Tassus, and we seen, uh, uh, there was, like, 10 churches sprung up in this area, which was two hours out of the city, and it was isolated, and... Ten churches sprung up. I think we went to the baptism that day, and there was 300 people in this church. And we were way, way up, you know, like people had to come over the mountains to come to the church. Yeah, so it, it, was, it was God at work, right? And uh, it was a blessing for me to receive that and to see that. And the one pastor in the city where we preached, he was, uh, he said, you know, I facilitate, I facilitate, but he used a different word, but he was, it was translated, so it kind of translated a little different, but that's the way I took it. Like, he said, I lift other people up and allow God to, to use people in those areas, and I just stand back and let God work. And I, I thought, wow, I took note of that. That's a blessing right there because that's leadership, right? And that shows you that God can work by his spirit that way. Okay. Praise the Lord. Glory adios. Okay. <laughs> okay. And yeah, it's interesting because God works in our lives. Like, I got to be, and that's what I was encouraged by the pastor down there. I have, to, I have to be who I am and how God works in me. I preach the Bible and the preach the truth, but God works in my heart different than He works in yours because we're different, right? And the first time I went down there, uh, the, we were playing basketball. And the guy, and I, I never played that much basketball in my life. And he said, yeah, watch, watch that guy out there. He just stays in one spot, and 
he waits for the action to come to him. And I was, I was wearing myself out, going everywhere, and running around like a chicken with my head cut off. And, uh, and then somebody else pointed that out. Actually, the, the guy that and pointed it out, and then I was got up to preach, and I said, hold on a second. I just got to be like on the basketball court where I'm just staying. I'm in control. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be at peace here, and I'm going to wait, and I'm going to... So that really helped me. It was interesting because, you know, that's the way God works in my heart, and each one of us different, right, based on our, who we are, based on our upbringing and stuff, and... Let's turn to 1 Kings 19, 16 to 21. Oh, do we have that on the... Or I'll just read it. Okay. And I'll look at verse 16 here. And, and Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha the son of Shabbat of... Abel Miho La, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in my room. So there's a call on Elijah's life, and the prophet prophesied it, and uh, we're talking about missions and how God's working in our lives, and whatever call or whatever area God is calling us to, or whether it's work or whether it's, you know, but he wants, to, he wants us to use each one of us as different vessels, right? So here is a call of Elijah. And, but it never happened yet because he never, it was a, he was told to go prophesy this. And when I was down there the first time, somebody prophesied and, and, prof, and to me, and I was like, but it read my mail and it was like, don't hold back, don't hold back. You have something to say, so say it. Don't think you, that you have nothing to say. And then the guy went like this and I knew what he meant. He said, preach the word of God, right? And I was like, okay, right? And yet I waited all those years because of I'm timid or whatever, but just like the call, it's a time fulfilled when God has that time, right? And we obey. So um, 1 Samuel 3, 4. It says. No, oh, hang on. And the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, here am I. So there was a call on Samuel's life as well, right? But he o obeyed and said, here am I. But like I said, God works on our hearts, and uh, his spirit's working in us, and the word works in us and convicts us. And so there's that call, right? And then the another part of it is, I, Lord, I'm not ready. I can't do that. And... Uh, and that's, you know, I mean, we can't. In our own strength, we can't. But some of us have different strengths and weaknesses. And God works and prepares us for what his purposes are, right? Eternal purposes, not natural purposes. Well, I'm a good carpenter, and I can do this, and I'm really good at it. And it's a gift, right? And God uses that, but he also, he'll use somebody, say, that's not good with in a certain area, but he'll take them and he'll prepare them for that, right? Maybe they're afraid or whatever, right? Um, so let's look at, uh, so he prepares us for what's coming up ahead, not for, and it's sometimes it's not what we think or expect. So like 20 years ago, like Teresa said, oh, the mission field, right? Well, I thought about that for years and years and years, and I always said, well, I don't know, what am I gonna do? Right? I can't do this, which in reality I can't. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. So I'd always pray like, Lord, uh, uh, speak through me. Right? Speak through me, Holy Spirit. I think David said that, right? He said that he would pray that the Holy Spirit would speak through him. And I'd always pray that. And I said, speak through me, Holy Spirit. Pre and maybe through that, God was preparing me. And I also read, uh, used to read all the time, Isaiah 6, verse 8, and Isaiah 6, verse 8 says, Whom shall I send and who shall go before me? And the second part of that, he said, Lord, here am I, send me. And I would always pray that, Lord, Lord, send me. I, you know, help, send me. I, and, uh, but whether that was me or God, but there was a preparation time, right? And then we look in Acts 6, uh, two to five, 
and how Stephen and Philip, uh, they were prepared in their serving, right? Because they, they served in, um, okay, I'll, I'll turn there. Or maybe I'll, I'll, I'll wait till he gets it up there. But uh, in verse, 1 Kings 19, 19, and 20, I'll read that first. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll look at that. Okay. Um, so, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. That's what the disciple, that's what the, um, the 12 disciples were saying. And Stephen and Philip were one of the 12 that they called to serve tables, right? And to help in the church. So, uh, we know that Stephen and Philip afterwards, they be, God used them as evangelists afterwards. So the, even in the serving tables, Philip and Stephen, God prepared through their service. And um, as God prepares us through the service for Jesus, right? Wherever we serve Jesus, he prepares us in that area, in that position that we're at, right? And so let's look at 1 Kings 19, 19 and 20 again. And I'll read that. So he departed thence and found Elijah son of Shaphath, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and with the 12, and Elisha passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow thee. And he, he had said unto him, go back again, for what have I done unto thee? Uh, so in 19, he says, who was plowing with his 12 yoke of oxen before him. Um, so he was serving with a team, leading that team of oxen, and the oxen plow and get the ground ready for what's happening, right, in the harvest. And I, look, I looked at that like in the New Testament, God uses each one of us in the field because the fields are ripe unto harvest. The field is the world, right? And we're called to go preach the gospel in the world. And here Elijah was serving with that team. And he was leading the team, right, in what they were doing for God. Like I'm using New like in the New Testament, right? And God was using him there. And then the call and preparing him for what was coming up ahead. And, uh, and in Mark 9.35, it says, um, The greatest among you will be the servant of all. So as we serve... God uses that because we're humbling ourselves before Jesus and we're serving the Lord and we're helping and we're, and we're leading as we serve, right? It's not being served, which is the world's way, but it's his way is to serve like Jesus served us and gave us salvation. And so just as we serve him, it's a time of preparation and for service and and it's not a, for me, it was an overwhelming thing. Well, I used to say, well, I can't preach. God, I don't know what to say. And, and I realized, it was like, okay, you, you were anointed to preach, Luke 4.18. He said, Jesus Christ was anointed to preach. And you give me your spirit, you give me your word, and you've anointed me, us, to preach the gospel. So it's in his hands. It's not in my hands. So that's like, oh. Lord, you were anointed to preach, and you needed the anointing of the Spirit. You needed the Holy Spirit in you, and you were God. And so to preach, okay, Lord, it's in your, your court, and if I'm going to speak, you're going to speak through me, and you're going to anoint me, and see his work, not my work. So, and that's part of surrendering and submitting and serving. And then God prepares us for what he wills, right? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And whatever that looks like, we have to <clears throat> wipe the slate clean and say, okay, God, I'm a new creation, and you can use me whatever way you called me to. Whatever that looks like, God, I want that. Sorry. And I used to apologize, too, because I would say something. I'd be talking to people somewhere, and I'd say something really strong. And I would always say, I'm sorry. And then after a few years, I thought, why am I saying sorry? Because... God wants to do something in their lives, and obviously, it's not me enforcing it really strong. It was a spirit speaking through me with the word, and most of the time, it was the word of God coming through me. And like all of us, we need to be open to the Holy Spirit so God can use us and to 
bring us to the place he wants us to go, right? And to be ready for that, right? And to be willing for, to allow God to change our hearts. Uh, and he changes our hearts and prepares us, right? And in Spanish, I hope I get this word right, cambio. That means change, right? It's cambio. And I would hear that in Mexico. Cambio me. Cambio me. Change me. Okay, Lord, change me. And as we submit, we change. And, and that's basically Christianity, right? I mean, we're submitting our lives to Christ, the cross, the crucified life, so that he gives us his life and so that he can use us um, and be obedient in whatever way he chooses, not the way I choose, because I would choose to sit at the back of the church, right? It's comfortable there, right? I'm just being honest, right? And, uh, and as we see Elisha, one here, the second part, then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him, and uh, afterwards he went and became his servant, so we follow, if Jesus has that next step for us, or the next area, we arise and we follow him in obedience, whether it's to missions, whether it's to whatever area, whatever talent God's given you, Let's be obedient and obey that call as he's working by his spirit. Because it's kind of cool because it's not us. It's his spirit. And it's like, wow, you got this, Lord. You got this. I don't have this. But you got this. And if you say, and if I'm feeling that quickening of the Holy Spirit and the word of God, there's a blessing because it's beautiful what Jesus does. Amen. Glory a Dios. Gracias, Señor. Oh, I think you have my little book there. Oh, I don't know. A little red one? Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to you a little bit this morning about um, my process in missions, or our, maybe our process in missions, but this is more from my, my perspective. And be before I do that, I just we're going to go um, sort of backwards in a way. So I'm going to introduce you to somebody who's been kind of at the end process of the missions for me. So I'm going to invite Olga to come. She's been so gracious to stay for the next service with her little boy who's probably sleepy. <laughs> so this is my friend Olga. And... Uh, Olga came came to the church, I'm not sure how long ago, five months ago, yeah. and we immediately, I just connected with her, and because, you know, she reminded me of a lot of the people that I, I know in the Dominican and the Spanish um, speaking, and, and, and the, the fact that we couldn't, you know, maybe communicate the best was okay, like, it didn't bother me. I've, I've kind of already worked through that, so it was easy for me to, to connect with her. So we, I wanted to just have Olga share a few things because she's coming here um, from a different place and has to assimilate into our culture. Just when we go, when Cliff goes to Mexico or Patricio goes to Costa Rica, I mean, he speaks Spanish, so that helps. Um, but you know, when we go to the Dominican, we're still we're 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 in a different culture, and there's a lot that goes along to that, not just language, right? So there's there's that culture sort of shock kind of thing. So, um, are you going to come, Patricia? Okay. So I I was wanted to ask Olga just a little bit about herself and her story, and how she ended up in Campbell River. Quiero preguntarte cómo, un poquito de tu historia y cómo llegaste a Camber River. Oh, bueno. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I did the same mistake before. <laughs> I want to ask you about uh, how did you get here and a uh, little bit about your story. And so go for it. Bueno, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Olga. Soy colombiana. Uh, hello, my name is Olga and I am from Colombia. 
llegué en el año 2017 a Campbell River de vacaciones por unos meses. I came to Campbell River for holiday in 2017. En esas vacaciones conocí al que hoy en día es mi esposo. And in those holidays I met the one who is my husband today. En el año 2018 me vine a vivir a Campbell River y aquí nació mi hijo. In 2018 I came to live here in Campbell River and my son was born here. Eh, no hablo, eh, estoy aprendiendo inglés en este momento, tengo una profesora, puedo escuchar, es más fácil en el momento para mí que hablarlo. I am learning English right now and I have a, a person who is teaching me, but for me it's easy to hear English than to speak it. Eh, eh, the next question. <laughs> <laughs> what has been the hardest thing, challenge for you moving from Columbia to Campbell River? ¿Qué lo que ha sido lo más duro para ti moverte desde Colombia a Campbell River? Lo más difícil para mí ha sido separarme de mis padres, de mis hermanos, de mi familia, the la más arraigada. The arraigada hardest aquí. part for me is separate myself from my father, mother, my sibling. Eh, es, ha sido pues un reto, un desafío muy grande eh, introducirme en esta nueva cultura. It has been very hard for me to introduce myself to this different culture. Sí, y es una nueva vida que he empezado porque eh, volví a empezar hace el año pasado, volví a empezar mi vida. Entonces, con muchos milagros que, que han ocurrido en mi vida, que cuando aprenda inglés se los comentaré. Ok, it has been very hard for me to adapt, but uh, last year I start a new uh, uh, thing in my life where I start again. But when I learn more English, I will be able to tell you more about it. I also wanted to know, um, is there anything you think we can do as a church um, to help people like yourself or others that come from a different culture to help you with your process? Hay algo que podemos hacer a través de la iglesia para ayudar a personas como tú que vienen de otra cultura. Continuar siendo como lo han sido hasta el momento, porque el primer día que llegué a esta iglesia, Dios me colocó en, esta, en este camino, o sea, de venir a esta iglesia, me la mostró. Y cuando entré por esa puerta, ustedes me trataron como si fuera alguien de su familia, como si me conocieran de hacía muchos años, las personas que me recibieron, todas. God, pues. God make a miracle in my life because the first time that I, God was the one that sent me to this church, and when I came here for the first time, people hugged me and people welcomed me, and I felt very welcome here. Lo mejor que puede pasar con un inmigrante, con una persona que venga de otro país, es seguir abriéndole los brazos así como lo han hecho hasta el momento. The best thing that can happen to a person that comes from another country is that you open your arm and keep welcoming them. Cada uno de nosotros tiene diferentes motivos por los cuales estamos aquí. Cada uno de, de los inmigrantes que estamos en este país. We all have different uh, uh, things why we are here. As, a, as a coming from another country, we all come in different ways. Y lo no hay nada mejor que sentirse como en su propio país. There is nothing like to feel when you are in your own country. Y así pues nos hacen sentir ustedes. And Muchas you, gracias. And you made me feel that way here. Thank you. Well, I, th I think God sent Olga here just, just to help me learn Spanish <laughs> because he was like, apparently she needs some more help. <laughs> and my friends in the Dominican, you know, every time I go, they're kind of like, how come you don't know much more than you knew last time? <laughs> so <laughs> she's been helping me with Spanish, and she says I'm helping her with English, but I'm, I'm not really, just a little bit. <laughs> well, thank you, Olga, for sharing. We appreciate you. Bless you. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So 
Peter and I are going on another um, trip to the Dominican in January for three months. So we've been building up to this over the years. You may have gotten bits and pieces um, of what has brought us to this point. But I wanted to share a little more of the process just so you can get a better understanding how that could come about for somebody. I know Cliff you know, was sharing some of his experience so Peter and I um, first went to the Dominican in 2005 for our 25th wedding anniversary. Aren't we cute? <laughs> My hair's even a different color. Wow, I look so young. Nice picture of us. Very romantic, right? Right? Keep that in your mind as I continue. So we ended up in, in the Dominican as the church here, Matt, was wanting to start a short-term missions program. We had already established a relationship with Phil and Donna from Servant's Heart, which we support. And normally, we if we went on a vacation, we'd gone to Mexico a few times, and that was kind of the go-to. You know, it's closer and, and all that. But we thought, okay, we'll, we'll go further, and we'll, we'll go check out the DR. So I'm just going to read to you something I wrote in my journal. Um, this was May 2015. It was definitely a culture shock when you first arrive. So where we went to is Sasua, which is just outside of Puerto Plata, which is where we're working. It reminds me a lot of Mexico in some ways. The landscape, language, and needs of the people are quite similar. I was a little shocked to find out that prostitution and pedophilia is well known here. It's a little hard to take in when you see old men with girls far too young for them. It's also the root of a lot of the social problems in the culture here and a lack of respect for women. So Peter, being the respectful husband that he is in re regard for his lovely bride, forgot to mention a few things to me. Just protect the innocent which was me. So when we got there, I mean, you know, the hotel was nice and the, the beach was great and all that. But as you went outside, it was a different story. So the streets were dirty. There was a lot of things like in your face. There was a lot of desperation, a lot of desperate people around. And I thought, why did Peter bring me here? I, I didn't really think that I would want to come back. And I wasn't really, I wasn't really feeling it. You can put on the next slide. So then the process started. So we were able to um, tag on with another team that was visiting from Nova Scotia. We just happened to be on the same plane as them. And they graciously allowed us to do that. So first we went to a children's home, um, which has had at the time about 25, 30 children. So the children there either don't have family or the family just can't afford to look after them or social services has had to step in. So this is Jasmine, and she's just one of the many children that took a piece of my heart. Children, faces, stories, real people, real needs, God's love. So this is Rosanna. So during that trip, we were also able to paint a house for a couple, Rosanna and Pedro, and their daughter, Rosaura. I will never forget when she came walking down the hill, barefoot, five months pregnant, to where the house was being built. She was willing to serve us in any way she could. She'd offer us coffee and biscuits and be moving things around. And off to the side, there was a wheelchair that was laying in the rubble. Just three weeks earlier, they had lost their 11-year-old son and were still deep in grief. But in, in the midst of that struggle, she still you know, came and, and was, was serving us with her amazing hospitality. So the place that my flesh didn't like, God planted a seed anyways. <laughs> so I'm just going to read you something else that I wrote out of my journal from that time. So it was May 21st. It was an exciting day today. I was able to get a plaque painted for Rosanna and her family, which we uh, wrote on it, Casa de Pedro, which is up on the sign there, um, dedicating the house um, to 
her son because her son's name that passed away was Pedro and her um, also the father's name is Pedro. And then at the time working, we had three Peters on our team. So my Peter and two others. So um, we did that for them. Um, so Dario took us out to her house so we could give give it to her along with a housewarming gift we had bought. I just kept thinking I wanted to get her a coffee pot with cups, etc. She was so excited because she had been using her in-laws and they wanted it back. We had such a good visit with her. It was happy and sad. She talked a lot about her son who had just passed away. She told us that at birth when the doctor was delivering him, his neck was broken but they would not admit it. So he was in a wheelchair until he passed away at age 11. I felt so connected with her and her family. It will be so nice for them to have the house to move into because right now they're living in about 150 square foot room with everything they own in it. So needless to say, we took our first team in the fall of 2015 15 and built a house for Jesus and Matilda. They are wonderful Christians looking after a bunch of grandchildren, some their own and some not, which is very common there, living out of a makeshift home because they had lost everything in a flood. So this is Matilda. She's working in the kitchen, um, outside kitchen, which is pretty common there. Like this, I mean, we look at it and kind of go, oh, but... It's actually, you know, pretty, works pretty good um, for her at that time. There was nothing more glorious than to dedicate their home. They were so gracious and thankful. And Jesus, with tears of joy, said thanks to God and to us for his new home, because in the natural it would have been impossible. So this is Jesus. Um, he's always smiling. It doesn't matter what's going on. He's always grinning from ear to ear. And if you ever stop in at his home... They welcome you. They make you feel so um, just loved. And he'll f go find coconuts. Like if there's a tree with coconuts, he just, you know, be right back. And he comes and he gets the coconuts and he cuts them open. And you're, you're drinking coconut juice, whether you like that stuff or not. Like, <laughs> but I, I happen to like it. And uh, so that's what he does. They're such gracious and loving people. So no matter um, what their circumstances are, what their needs are, they will always offer, open up their home to you. So I was starting to see things a little more from God's heart. I think something is starting to sprout. Uh, this was the first team that we were able to take from the church that same year and build. This is Jesus and Matilda's home that we were able to build. And every time we go back, we always visit with all, the, all of the people that we've connected with. And they all live pretty close by. So um, this, that was a real blessing. I'm not sure who's on the next slide. So this is Rafa. She's had many battles and challenges with her daughter, Jessica, who suffers with a disability, but who always welcomed us like honored guests in her home, inviting us in for coffee. She opens her home for Bible studies. And she also has beautiful orchids in her, in her yard. She works in, in the ministry in the community center and is such a blessing to the, the area, to the community, and to the children. She has such a heart for God. So this is um, when we, another team. We, we took Lena and then uh, Jessica in the middle and Trisha from the church here, and then that's Rafa, the mom, on the other side. So then this is Sylvia. Again, always smiling every time we saw them, even though they were, they're aging. Um, her husband would still walk miles to go to work for the city. It's not like a city job here. It's, um, you know using your, your back labor and then a machete is how they, how they clear. And, but he was, he was always happy, happy, you know, every time he saw us. And then Sylvia, she makes really good coconut cookies. So every time we saw her, she would give us this coconut cookies, but people, you know, love them. The teams love them. So, um, you, you'd be 
you know, did you get some of Sylvia's coconut cookies? But she would go and sell, sell this to make money, right? Um, so this is Eliana, who is Sylvia's granddaughter. So they were so happy that we were able to, I think we, we painted um, in the house that was already built for them. So that was the connection that we have. So um, she, this little girl has a problem walking. Um, and you know, she's getting been getting some help over time and some therapy. So it was really nice to be able to to connect with them. And the next slide. Oh, that's Trisha painting the house and Bobby at the same time. That was part of one of the teams that we had. And then the next slide. So this is um, SUNY. Her and her husband, they operate a local grocery store in the community, and they're, they're pillars in their community. People really look up to them. So Suni just collapsed in my arms um, when I saw her grieving the loss of her son. So I think I've shared this before, but women in the DR, it can be, it can be difficult for them to go through their grieving process because they just need to, like, get back you know, with life and, and, and things. And it's, it's a bit of a fact of life there because there's a lot of um, young boys or men that, you know, just about every family, you know, somebody has either been hurt or, or like maimed or, or possibly have, has lost someone in a, in a motorcycle accident. And it's because um, down there, what they call them motos, it's their main mo mode of transport because it's um, economical. Right, and a lot of them are doing that for a business, so it's just there's a lot of them on the roads, and it's um, obviously you know different than it is here. So she hadn't had a chance to grieve, and we were we we were able to minister God's love to her. So I have such a connection with her now. Every time we see each other, we just scream and hug each other. And again, it doesn't matter um, whether we are un understanding each other; it's all the same. So I think I, I see some little shoots, some tender leaves starting to uncurl. I can see the leaves starting to grow on this plant now. It's like a vine now growing over the dirt, over the place of dislike, over the things my flesh didn't like. Smells, things I didn't understand, things I thought were different. I can see this vine starting to take hold and take root in my heart. So these are just some of the relationships that I was able to to form over the last five years I mean even just looking through pictures we have thousands of pictures that we need to you know every time you go we take all these pictures and then we go with other teams and take more pictures but there's you know so, so many um, connections that we've made but you know these are, are some that stood out to me and then there's all the the people from Servant's Heart that we connected with um, all the staff there, Phil and Donna, Dario and Rebecca, Calvin, Wendy, Dave and Sandy, so many others that have had such an impact in our lives. And then there's all the people here that pray for us and have supported us and helped us be an extension from our church. So this was uh, one of our teams that went. And... Uh, oh. I'm just going to read you out of 1 Corinthians 13. Love is the greatest. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. It's not rude. Actually, it's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. 
So it's funny how God and my husband, it's like they're, they've teamed up together or something, seem to, to know more what I need than what I think I need or want. So like we sung this morning about good, good father. Um, I'm just going to read to you a little, another thing I found this morning, if I can find it. This was a dream. I, I'm a dreamer, so I, I many times have dreams. This was like 2014. I dreamt that Peter and I were going on a trip somewhere. It was like we were part way. I was in line out on the tarmac. I took a look at my airline ticket. When Peter booked them, he booked me on one plane and him on another. <laughs> right? <laughs> I could see both planes. The one I was on was the Bullet, an economy airline, pretty basic. The plane Peter was on was the luxury plane. Yeah, right? I think I w woke up feeling kind of upset about that, even though I didn't think it was something that he purposely did. So I, 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 you know, I prayed and pondered over that, like, what did that mean? And it was too, you know, there been times in preparation for getting ready for the Dominican um, when I still had my business and some things like that where, you know, we didn't always see eye to eye on things like how long we should go for. So you know, even now, Peter would say, oh, let's go for six months. And I'd go, how about less? <laughs> so th some things like that, just some details. Um, so like it came up I think Teresa was talking about it, that s what God requires of us or what it looks like. So like this dream that I had, it was like um, Peter was taking the high road and I was taking the low road. But sometimes what we think looks like the high road actually isn't the high road. So it's you know, knowing from God's perspective what the high road looks like. And like Cliff said, you know, the high road sometimes can be a, a low road. So it's knowing and trusting God and your husband that sometimes they, they know, know better than, than you do. Well, sometimes God always knows better. Most of the time, my husband does. So now you know a little more of the story how Peter and I got to this point. So God has called Peter and I to be part of what is going on in the Dominican. You are also a part of us as we go. So it's not more spiritual because we're going and doing this. It, it could be, for you, it could be going to another country, but it could be not. It could be whatever's going on in your own home or neighborhood. Wherever God has placed you, we all have a different part to play in the body so this is our part or, or part of the part anyways. And sometimes do I wish God had called me somewhere else? Yes. Sometimes it's kind of inconvenient traveling a day, three flights to get somewhere and then be away from my family. My flesh doesn't really like it at times. And yes, there are lovely beaches. I don't know why I feel like crying when I say lovely beaches, but anyways. <laughs> And it's warm and all those things, but there's a lot of other things that aren't, aren't as glamorous. But would I trade it? No. I may have five years ago, but not now. Not that I've, now that I've seen the people and have the connection and continued to, to be able to do that. That's, that's the thing that is, that brings you back. So now I can see on the plant, on the vine, a flower. Now there's a flower growing, a flower that wasn't there before. God knows what he's doing, even when I can't see it. He puts that seed in our heart and allows it to grow over time. And it really comes down to love, love of God, love for people, and it doesn't matter where those people are. It doesn't matter if there's a cultural difference or if they speak a different language. 
And I have found that a hug in any language is still a hug. And there's so many times um, we've been put in situations I didn't know what to do or say, but I, knew, I know how to hug. So a kind look, a touch on the shoulder means just as much, even if there's a language barrier. So today I want to encourage you to find where God has placed you to be and what mission has he asked you to do. He's given us all a mission. It's called the Great Commission to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. And in closing, I just want to say, when your husband asks you to go on a romantic trip somewhere warm for your 25th wedding anniversary, you may want to get more information. <laughs> just saying. This is my husband, Peter, if you didn't know. Hi. I just wanted to give you a, a quick update of what's happening down there and uh, what we'll be doing down there. Um, the audio video crew is just going to queue up a video here of an update from, from Servant's Heart as to what's happening down there. Uh, we work with an organization called Servant's Heart. And... Uh, they run a number of different ministries down there. The one that we're involved with the most is the community center. And uh, currently, uh, they've just installed a large cistern, a few thousand gallons. Um, and last year, a team from a, a business called H2O for All uh, installed a, w a drinking water filtration system. So now that's going to be hooked up to the cistern, and people will be able to come to the community center and get safe drinking water because uh, they're having to buy it now and sometimes they can't afford it and that kind of thing. So now they'll have a consistent access to free drinking water. Uh, so it should help the health of the community. And uh, it's a really neat thing. And uh, we have an update. Looks like it's ready to go. Uh, from Servant's Heart, this was done in September, but we haven't shown it yet. So we'll just play that and then I'll fill you in on what we're going down to do. Williams, co-founder of Servants Heart Ministries, your ministry partner in the Dominican Republic. As you know, in the community of Loma de los Chipos, we have the Loma Project, which is a program designed to speak into the lives of the community, children, adolescents, young women, moms and dads. This summer, for the first time, we were able to do a vacation Bible school program with the children of the community and the surrounding area. We had over 113 children attend, which represented five different churches. Now, bringing five churches together to celebrate Jesus was just an amazing thing. But even better than that, 45 of the children that came out had no church affiliation at all. At the end of the summer, we were able to do a parade through the streets of Loma. And the entire community came out to celebrate along with the children and the staff and the people involved. Waving flags, carrying banners, playing drums. It was a great time for all. We just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for helping us do this. Thank you for speaking into the lives of the children of the community of Loma and the surrounding area. And thank you for reaching 45 children with the message of Jesus Christ. God bless. So Tanya and I will be going down to work with the teams that come down. So the kind of the busy team season is uh, February till Easter, and then they get a few teams after Easter. Our responsibility is to liaison between the teams. The majority of them come from Canada. The odd one comes from the States. Um, same as we sent our team, our church sent teams down. And they're doing a variety of different things. Some are building, some are medical teams, some are agricultural. There's a number of different things that they do. Um, but we go with the teams and we help to bridge the gap between the North American teams and the Dominican people that they're working with and the Dominican staff that is driving the teams and interpreting and doing all of the other things that are part of the program. Uh, so that'll be our job. We're really looking forward to it. 
and uh, we're blessed to be able to do that. Yeah. In closing, I just wanted to uh, read Mark 28, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya and Peter. That was really good. Get to know your heart for mission. And you said you have them in your heart, and that's why you go back again, and you go back, and you go back. I think Ian and I did 12 trips to Mexico, been to Ghana, and uh, lots in Canada, one coast to the other. And so if you're, you know, if you've had a word somewhere from the Lord to um, dabble in missions, get your feet wet. Sign up to go maybe with Tanya and Peter. They're going in January, February, March this year. Um, and I know they'll be going again. And there's also, um, well, there's Mexico. I don't, uh, Costa Rica, I think we, we also go to Costa Rica. So if you're thinking of missions, see, maybe even see Peter and Tanya. That would be good. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for, um, Lord, you're, you're, you just pursue us with your love. And because you've pursued us with your love, we can reach out and, and uh, bring your love and your care to others. Father, I want to thank you for healing us. There's many away with colds and flus and whatnot, and we just thank you that you are our healer. And I speak that over your body here, Lord. I speak healing, commanding colds and flus to go in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for bringing peace in this season for everyone and our families in Jesus' name. Amen. Go and have a good week. Healthy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Does anybody need a ticket for the dinner on next Sunday night, uh, the Christmas dinner? And uh, just see Tanya, please, on the way out, if you have not gotten your tickets yet. And uh, if you can't buy one, uh, maybe just let her know if you're wanting to go but you're not able to, to pay for it. The church can help. So, Thank you. <laughs>